So one piece of announcements, um, our final review session will be uh, next Thursday, March 15th, 7 to 8.30 p.m. It's being led by Zach and Nolan, who are two awesome section leaders. Uh, and yeah, please come show up. It's in 370, 370, and they'll be going over a lot of t different types of problems you'll see on the midterm, come with lots of questions. It will not be video recorded. Okay, so let's talk about inheritance. Um, so inheritance is a way of relating two different classes in a way that minimizes code redundancy between the classes and allows different classes to be treated similarly by the client, which is a topic that we'll come back to on Monday. Uh, and as part of this, we'll be uh, implementing a series of classes that build up a system of employees, so different types of employees who are all related to each other. Okay, so inheritance uh, is a way to indicate that two classes are related and a way to share code between two or more classes in a hierarchy. So an important part of inheritance is that you have one class as the parent of another class that's the child. Uh, so generally what that looks like is you have one class extends another, meaning that it absorbs its data and behavior. So the super class is the parent class and the subclass is the child class. So Essentially what you usually see is that a subclass can do everything that a superclass can do, but it might do it a little bit differently and it might be able to do more. Okay, so an example of this would be uh, the G object family. Um, so you might have seen this in Java, right? Uh, but we also have these libraries in C++ and basically there are all these different types of graphics, uh, like a G oval or G line or G label. And then they're all different types of what we call G objects. And the advantage of that is you get to say that there's all this common behavior. So like, uh, you know, various different types of graphics can contain a certain point or have a color or have a location on the screen, right? So it doesn't really matter if what you're displaying is a string text label or a line or a, or a rectangle, they're all going to be somewhere on the screen, right? So get X, get Y kind of means the same thing for all of those, right? Um, but you also have that these different subclasses might have unique behavior or might implement these a little bit differently. So um, a G label, for example, has a font um, or has the text that you can set versus that would be kind of meaningless for a polygon to have. Like what does it mean for a polygon to be in font times New Roman, right? So you'd see that um, by creating this hierarchy, you can take advantage of some of this common behavior and common code but you also can still implement your own methods that are specific to the class that you're implementing. So what questions do you all have about inheritance, why we might want to do it? Okay, um, so as part of this example, we're going to implement uh, some classes of employees. So all employees make 40, there are like all these rules. It doesn't really matter what the rules are. Um, we just wanted to define common behavior for employees. And then in addition to that, we have these types of employees, like subtypes of employees, right? Um, like lawyers or programmers or secretaries or patent lawyers that can do extra things. So we'll focus mostly on the lawyers and the patent lawyers. So lawyers can do everything an employee can do, um, but they also know how to sue people, right? Very important skill for a, pat for a lawyer. Patent lawyers uh, know how to sue people and also uh, know how to file patents, how to make people super wealthy by filing patents, okay? So um, I won't code up all of the employee class because it's not that interesting, right? You have these hours, salary, et cetera. You know, we have, this would be our class definition, okay? So then you can imagine our lawyers can do, have all the same behavior and they know how to sue. So let's write a lawyer class, okay? And so our patent lawyers do everything employees can do. They know how to sue and they know how to um, file patents. So let's write that. Does anybody see any problems with these classes? What'd you say? Yeah, it's a lot of the same code, right? So 
generally in CS 106A and CS 106B, like at this point in your CS careers, you should know like code redundancy is bad. We have failed to teach you anything else, like code redundancy is bad. Um, and so you know how to decompose into methods and that sort of thing to try to minimize this redundancy. But in a case like this, we don't have a great way for your patent lawyer to be able to directly call employee. So that's why we have this whole inheritance relationship is so that you can have, you, know, you can take advantage of this shared common behavior. So what that usually looks like in code is you would have class, uh, you know, whatever your name is, like lawyer, and then this colon, which you can kind of read as extends if the Java keyword. They didn't want to make it an actual word for like, kind of historical reasons, but they, so they used a colon. It just means extends, um, public, and then super class, whatever. So this would look like class, lawyer, extends, public, employee. So what this means is now every, um, every lawyer just automatically gets an hour's salary, vacation days, and vacation form automatically. You don't need any of that code. Right? It just automatically has it. You don't need to write those methods. You don't need to change them in any way. They're just there. So you kind of get all this great functionality. Okay? So, um, okay. Uh, so let me pull up. Okay, so this is our original lawyer code, right? Um, so if we write it to say public. You know, now we don't actually need it to define any of these methods because they already come in through the employee superclass. And then in here, we can just get rid of all this code too because employee already defines those methods. So that code will just be already there for us. So that's really cool. We created like this whole new type of employee. We had to write four lines of code. What questions do you all have about that? So um, we talked a little bit about these other two. So here we have you know, our employee, um, you know, our employee class, and then we have our lawyer, right? Um, so where do you? How do you think the programmer should be factored into this? A programmer does everything that an employee can do, and then also knows how to write code. So do you think, how many, so does anybody have any ideas of what might be a good super class for a programmer? Yeah. Yep. So we can put this here. So we'll put programmer. Okay. Um, what about the patent lawyer? So a patent lawyer does everything an employee can do and also knows how to sue and how to, um, file a patent. Yeah. Yeah, so here we actually can put the patent lawyer to extend lawyer because you have that the patent lawyer does everything that the lawyer does and, and you know, implicitly everything the employee does and just has this added functionality. So in the cases like this, it's actually better to have something that looks like this versus, you know, having patent lawyer as a direct subclass of employee because you're able to take advantage of the patent lawyer's um, or sorry, you're able to take advantage of the lawyer's sue method in your patent lawyer. Okay. What questions do you have about this? So um, this then leads to the obvious next question or maybe an obvious next question of, Okay, so this is great because our employees happen to all have the same, you know, four methods and then we're just extending them. But what would we want to do if we wanted to have these employees have a little bit of a different, um, to have different behavior, right? So, you know, not all employees make the same amount of money. Not all employees uh, have the same amount of vacation, et cetera. Right? So this is our same employee example from before. But, you know, now we have... Um, like some of these extra rules, okay? 
go. Um, you know, you might think, okay, well, what if we wanted to just change our lawyer to have a different, um, to have a different form, for example, so string lawyer vacation form, uh, which has, yeah, this should return pink instead of yellow, right? Um, so just to put this in perspective, let's run the program first. Run. This is our employee main. So, yeah, okay. Um, basically, you end up with, you can see, like, okay, here's the employee information for Lisa. Um, we can actually make Lisa an employee, right? Because by being a, um, by being a lawyer, Lisa is an employee. So that's one of the advantages of this inheritance structure. And we can call print employee info for Lisa. Right here, um, so okay, so see, they have the same information, which makes sense because they're both employees. So you might say, like, okay, if we wanted to change the behavior, the kind of logical thing is let's just you know write our own vacation form method. So the issue here is it's saying like it doesn't know vacation form exists because it's a method from employee, not a method from lawyer, right? So what's basically happening is that it's trying to use, a, like for lawyer, it doesn't actually explicitly say that, oh, we have this, um, we have this other method called vacation form. So it doesn't know to go look in the employee's class for that vacation form, right? Um, so, I don't know how you can see it, but the error message says out of line definition of vacation form does not match any declaration in lawyer. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay. So, in order to do this, we have to do something called overriding. So, overriding it, it involves replacing a superclass's method or member function with a new version in the subclass. So, that's what we were kind of trying to do with our uh, vacation form example. But the problem is in C++, you have to use this keyword called virtual, which tells the compiler like, okay, when you see this method in employee, you might actually have to look more specifically at the subclass to figure out what the actual method implementation is. This might be a method that's overwritten. Uh, C++ has like, this is one of those many quirks about C++ that we've grown to know and love over the course of this quarter. And basically just always call virtual. There's not ever really a good reason to not have virtual. So it should always be virtual, both in the superclass and in the subclass. Like any, once you start using virtual, just use virtual everywhere because it will avoid some weird bugs like what we just saw. Right? Yeah. Yes, so virtual only goes in the .h file. Um, and then in the .cpp, it's just like normal. Okay, and then you would also need to make sure you declare that method in the um, in the .h file for lawyer, not just in employee. Okay, so um, I guess we say like virtual string uh, vacation form. Great, and then here we'd want to say, okay, let's make this virtual. Right, um, and so now when you run it, you know, now it compiles and now it runs. Um, for some reason, it's not saying that it's yellow. Why is that? All right, hold on. Yeah. Okay. Um, there you go. So 
I forgot to declare it as a lawyer instead of an employee. So here you see now Lisa is pink instead of yellow, which is good. As an example of why virtual is so important, if we got rid of this virtual here in employee, it, it doesn't throw any compiler errors, it doesn't let you know anything's wrong, but when we get down here, now it's yellow instead of pink. So always just use virtual. Okay, so the question is, do you have to have virtual in your employee and in your, um, and in your <laughs> lawyer? Technically, you only need it in employee, but it's just like, in Java, if you did any inheritance in Java, the methods were automatically declared virtual. Like, C++ should have just used virtual, and they, like, it should have automatically been the behavior to just use virtual, and they didn't. They messed up. They got it wrong. Other object-oriented programming languages use like automatically just have all the overridden methods be virtual c plus plus doesn't so kind of the moral of the story is just use virtual it's not that much extra code and it's something that clients using your classes will come to expect yeah yeah so you should have virtual on all of these um, even if you don't override them it's okay to have them be virtual it just will tell the compiler like, hey, we might override this in the future. Just make, just keep an eye out and make sure that, um, you know, we're looking for the most specific, or you know, the most correct implementation. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, what if you want to override the parameters that are passed in? So in that case, um, two methods that have taken different parameters are actually treated differently, so they would be considered distinct uh, methods. So you can't really override the parameters passed in. Great question, though. You also can't override the return type. Um, great. Oh, yeah, way up in the back. Yes. Is that better? Okay, um, so that worked really well with our, you know, with our form. However, we also said that our lawyer gets paid twice as much as our programmer, or as our uh, employee does, right? So we could have just put in, you know, we could have written a method like this that just says, okay, you know, um, int lawyer, um, we need to put this into our lawyer.h. Um, and then here we would say salary. Um, we could have just said, okay, return 80,000. Okay, but the problem with this is what if we wanted, you know, inflation happens, we want to give all of our employees a 3% raise or something. If we were to do that, then if we change employee, lawyer won't see that change, right? Lawyer will still return 80,000, which means now we need to change code in two different places instead of one, or we are underpaying our lawyers. Neither of which is a great scenario, right? So in order to get around this, we can call and take advantage of the employee's salary method. So what that looks like is um, you would call salary and you have to specify that you're calling the employee's salary method, not the lawyer salary method. So if you were just to say return salary times two, that's recursion, right? And as we know, this would be missing a base case. Bad times would happen. You'd be paying them like two times you know, infinite amount of money. Okay, so just um, anytime you want to call a super classes member function, make sure you use the class name with the colons. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so the question is why are we calling the super classes salary? So in this case, we know that lawyer wants to be paid twice as much as, as normal employees are, or like non-lawyer employees are. And in order to get the value that non, so we could just say like, okay, employees are paid 40,000, so we'll, we'll be paid 80,000. But the problem with that is if we were to uh, bump up everybody's pay to 50,000, 
we would want lawyers to them still be, we would want them to be paid 100,000, not 80,000. So if you were to just to say, we would then need to like change it in two files instead of just in one, right? So that's why we're calling employee salary. So if we change something in the employee salary method, it will automatically be reflected in the lawyer salary method. So we can change that here. So employee salary times six. Yeah. Sorry, if Okay, so the question is, if we didn't have patent lawyer, would we still need to like copy all these changes from employee into the lawyer dot H? And so we would because um, like in order for lawyer to have its own salary method, you need to have a salary method defined in the dot H file. Um, yeah. So the question is, doesn't, wait, did we get a salary method from the last one? So yes, but we didn't get the ability to override from the uh, from employee.h. So we have a salary method from employee.h, but we don't have the ability to override it. We haven't told the computer that lawyer has a more specific um, implementation of salary. So that's why we need to put like the salary method in the .h file for lawyer. So the question is, do you have virtual in both? So okay. Virtual technically doesn't need to be in lawyer unless you're going to change the behavior in patent lawyer. But it's good programming practice just to make everything virtual because you, know, you might be writing this lawyer and not think that there's ever going to be a patent lawyer. And then somebody down the line is going to want to write a patent lawyer class, or they might want to, and then they're trying to use your class and you know, use inheritance and try to reduce code redundancy, which is great but they end up you know, trying to implement and override these methods and it doesn't work. So, did you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I explain what virtual does? Okay, so virtual does, it like tells the computer, okay, um, let me pull up employee.me. So here, you know, here we're passing in employee information, um, like an employee here and it will print out all this information about that employee like their salary and vacation days etc so what happens is we call employee.salary if you didn't have virtual it will just always use this um, like this methods employee right but if you define it as virtual then it will know okay we need to look for a more specific implementation We'll talk about this a little bit more on Monday when we, when it comes to polymorphism, which is when you like have a, a like object declared as its super type, right? Like a lawyer declared as an employee instead of as a lawyer. But yeah, basically it just tells the computer like, hey, there's something more, there might be a more specific, a better implementation. Like go and check to see is this employee actually a lawyer? And if so, go use lawyer salary instead of uh, employee salary. These are really good questions. So. Okay. So, okay, that kind of covered, we wanted to have different behavior, uh, or, okay, so we wanted to have, you know, extra behavior for the subclass, right, like being able to sue. It also covered that we wanted to have different types of employees have different implementations, right? So you wanted a lawyer to be paid more. Now the question is, what if we want to change the behavior of individual instances of these classes, right? Like not all lawyers are the same. Not all employees are the same, that sort of thing. So in general, what would we have to use in order to have each instance of a class have different behavior? Yeah, so basically, in general, you'd have to have a constructor that takes in these different parameters. So, okay, let's just say we have years, um, 
employees make $40,000 per year plus $5,000 per year worked, which is a great raise. Um, so, okay. Here we can write our constructor. So, let's say we have employee. Um, it takes in eight years, right? We'll make our private fields. Private eight years. Um, call this my years. We'll declare it down here. Employee, um, employee, years equals my years. Okay, and we'll do the same thing for lawyer. We'll give them a law school. Um, and they also get a constructor. Um, Um, we also need to change our employee dot. So we need to change this to be uh, plus five thousand times my years, so change years, right? And then we need to change employee main, which okay. Let's say this person's worked for two years. Let's say she went to Stanford Law School. Okay. Any questions about the changes that I just made? I just like implement a constructor. Yeah. The question is, where do I put my years? Um, okay, so where do I put my years equal to years? So that's in the implementation of the constructor, which is in the dot CPT. Yeah, so basically the dot H has the constructor declared and then the dot CPP implements it and the main actually uses the constructor. So those are the big changes I made. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, so we never had to use like a constructor for an employee in order to stick with an employee. So what is the difference between a constructor and an employee? Okay, stick with me for like two minutes and we will see. Great job. Yeah. Should that be a constructor? Yes. Yes, it should. Okay, let's try running it, see what happens. Today is I'm just showing you a lot of weird QT creator um, bugs. Oops. Hold on. Um, okay, so it's saying, how many of you have ever seen symbols not found for architecture x8664? Yeah, for those of you watching at home, you're probably also raising your hand because everyone here just raised their hand. So. I don't know if you've seen, you can go to compile output. Um, okay, so it's saying, uh, it's saying I didn't implement my lawyer constructor. Lawyer, during my law school. Law school equals my law school. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, so now it's saying constructor for a lawyer must explicitly initialize the base class employee which does not have a default constructor. So this is going back to your question. So what's happening here is whenever you create a lawyer, you're also creating an employee, right? Because lawyers are subclasses of employees. In order to create an employee, you have to call this employee constructor here that takes in a number of years. Okay? Um, and so what's happening here is it doesn't know how to call the employee uh, constructor because you would have to call it with a number of years. This is kind of a subtle point. Um, what questions are there about that? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the question is in order to fix that, do we need to change our constructor so it can take in the parameters for employee? So yes, that is totally right. Um, so here we can take in like an int my years. Um, I have to change this here, my years. Um, and then our employee main would have to change this. So maybe this person has worked for four years. Okay, so let's try running it again. And it's going to still have that same issue because even though we gave it the number of years, 
we have not actually told it what to do with that number of years, right? So the syntax for that looks like this, where again with the colons in C++, but basically you have the constructor and then you put a colon and you put the super class name with the parameter. So that's calling the super classes uh, constructor. So in this case, it would look like this, where you can say like employee of my years. What questions are there about that? Like this syntax. See, and now we can run it, it compiles, and indeed now you do have some variability based on the number of years that that person has worked. So the question is, sometimes you can have default parameters where nothing, where it will default assign a value if nothing is passed in. So you could, you know, you could do something like, okay, let's you know, not have this. Um, have our employee may not have passed this in. Lawyer.h not taken a number of years. And instead of having this number of years, we will say that, okay, into my years and we'll default initialize it to zero because we figure when you hire you don't have any work experience. So it should work, yes. So it does in fact work. The downside of this is really every time you make a lawyer you do want to be making an employee and if it makes sense that employees can be hired with non-zero number of years then it would also make sense that um, like a lawyer would be able to be hired with a non-zero number of years. So although default parameters would get around this issue that I was talking about, they still are not the best solution. Great question though. Okay. Okay. This is Kind of our final lawyer um, where they can take in a different salary, they can sue people, that sort of thing. Um, and then here's all the different methods that we implemented. Um, just to reiterate, you have this constructor um, that, has, that calls the super classes constructor. And then we're making sure that when we are overriding methods, if we need to call the super classes methods, we use uh, like the super classes name here. And then also making sure in our .h file that we use virtual for our methods. Okay. Any questions about kind of the mechanics of inheritance? I know C++ has kind of some really bad syntax here. C++ messed up, but the principles of inheritance are still the same. Um, so let's talk about some of the perils of inheritance. So I've told you all this great way to like minimize code redundancy and show these relationships between classes. And you might think like, oh, now I want to use this on everything. Or maybe not because you're like, wow, that was a lot of just garbage syntax. I never want to have to deal with that. But there are some cases where you don't want to use inheritance. So why don't you talk with a neighbor and try to see like if you would want to use inheritance in any of these three circumstances, or if you wouldn't, why wouldn't you want to use inheritance? Wow, it's like the least quiet conversations I've ever heard. Your most quiet conversations I've ever heard.
Okay. So what do you all think? Does anybody, how many people think that um, you should use inheritance for um, the, the 3D point versus the 2D point? How many people think you shouldn't? Okay. Yeah, the slide is called perils of inheritance if you're just using that. Um, what about square and rectangle? How many people think you should? How many people think you shouldn't? Okay, and how about sorted vector and vector? Should and shouldn't. Okay, so actually in all three of these cases, inheritance isn't quite the right approach because of uh, basically it changes the expected behavior. So if you call points 2D distance on a 3D point, that's going to have like the wrong behavior, right? Because you want to inc incorporate the Z coordinates as a distance away, right? So, you know, you could be at X, Y, or 0, 0, but you could be like 50 feet in the sky, right? Or something like you're on a skyscraper. So you might be at the same you know, X, Y location, but different Z location. And so that distance shouldn't be zero. Yeah. So the question is, what if you do point 2D extends point 3D and initialize the Z coordinate to zero? That would be a better choice because then you kind of have less of this unexpected behavior. Though you get into, should a 2D point be able to set like maybe there's a set Z coordinate or something for the 3D point. And so should a 2B, 2D point be allowed to have that functionality? And in that case, like that still might not be the right approach. We will get to that. Good question. Um, yeah. And then your know, rectangle doesn't have, or, you know, a square shouldn't have a set width versus set height method, right? That doesn't really make sense for a square. Um, and then, a sorted vector could confuse a client because what if you say, okay, vectors have, you can insert elements at, at index zero. And then if we go back and you know, the next line of code that we get is we print out this vector and the indices are all in the wrong order or you know, with recursive backtracking, there was a lot of like insert things at the beginning of our vector, recurse, delete things from our, the beginning of our vector. And if that thing that we're deleting is not the thing that we added, that could cause a lot of bugs. Okay. So this gets to something called Liskov's substitution principle, uh, which essentially is that you should be able to replace a class with an instance of its subclass and have the same expected behavior. So part of why I want to bring this up is this is named for Barbara Liskov, who is like phenomenal with object-oriented programming. She kind of redefined how people think about object-oriented programming and created a lot of these principles that uh, really guide how people program with classes and inheritance and things like that today. Um, she also, uh, do you remember when I talked about the Turing Award with Dijkstra? Yeah, so she won the Turing Award too. Um, and she's just, she's phenomenal. She's like one of the first women uh, in the US to ever get a PhD in computer science. Um, she's one of the first women to ever win uh, the Turing Award. Like really top notch computer scientist. And if you can't see the, uh, I don't know how you can see this in the back, but it says, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, but needs batteries, you probably have the wrong abstraction. Because you can't replace a duck with a you know, mechanical duck and expect it to have the same behavior, right? Okay. So now you're all thinking like, okay, we learned about inheritance, then we learned about these perils, and there doesn't seem to be a great way to get around it. What if I legitimately do have all of this redundant code that I want to take advantage of? Like um, what you were saying about the 2D point and the 3D point, it kind of ways to hide that behavior. So um, there is something called private inheritance. Remember when I said that you had to have, you know, class lawyer colon public employee? So you can also have a private, so that's public inheritance, which means that the client can call any of the employee methods on a lawyer object. Private inheritance means you get all the code, but you don't get all, you don't get the methods, if that makes sense. So you don't, clients would not be able to, if we were to have um, like class lawyer privately extends um, employee, you wouldn't be able to call all the employee methods on the lawyer object unless the lawyer object explicitly defined those methods. 
Okay, so generally we would do this for something like a sorted vector where we might want to hide the insert at index or something like that. Or, um, or in the in the 2D point example, if we had the 2D point extends the 3D point, then you might want to hide the change Z coordinate method of the 3D point, so you wouldn't choose to make that method public. What questions do you have about that? Yeah, so the question is like, this doesn't seem all that intuitive. Why would you ever want to do this in the real world? Um, basically, you would want to do this um, like a square and rectangle, like this G square and G rectangle would be a great example because you want to hide the get width and get height methods. And you also wouldn't want like a rectangle to have like a set side length method or something because that doesn't really make sense for a rectangle. So you like, but you do want to keep, you do want to have, like drawing a square is basically exactly the same as drawing a rectangle, right? And you know, having checking for an x y inside a square is the same as checking for an x y inside inside of a rectangle and that sort of thing. So that would be a real example where you would want to maybe privately inherit from G rect if you're making your own G square. Cool. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so the question is, what does this code actually look like? So let's go in here. Um, so let's say we privately extend employee. So um, what that kind of means is, um, first off, you can't, you can't ever say that, okay, we no longer acknowledge that Lisa is an employee. Lisa is just secretly an employee, so we as the programmers know that Lisa is an employee, but the uh, client doesn't. So we can't call this print employee info anymore. So, okay. Um, here. So let's just call her employee and comment this out. Great. So then, now what it says is vacation days is a private member of employee. So now it's like vacation because if we go back to our lawyer.h, we don't ever declare uh, vacation days. So instead of all of those methods from employee going into the public portion of lawyer, it's kind of in the private portion of lawyer. So it's like a private helper function. So when we go here, you get this uh, like vacation days is a private member of employee. So you can't actually call vacation days on a lawyer object. Yes, exactly. Um, so just to reiterate, um, it makes it so that the client can only call the methods that you want it to call. So if there are like harmful methods in employee, you can kind of get rid of that. Yeah. Um, so let's say you want to have um, our salary is based on the actual salary times two minus like vacation days times three or something. Um, so you can say, vacation days um, times three. So um, let me let me get rid of this line so we can compile it. So here you see that we've actually subtracted 30 because there are 10 vacation days. So it's used ex exactly the same way internally. It's just not used externally. It's kind of like you probably wrote a bubble up or bubble down method for your heap, hopefully you've decomposed it in some way. So it's kind of like that where you could call bubble up, but the client could not call bubble up. Yeah. So, so the question is, do you still have to use virtual? Um, I know virtual is like a real drag, but like you technically don't because, okay, so virtual, this will make more sense on Monday when I talk about um, like calling, like you're saying that a lawyer is uh, an employee. 
but because you kind of get rid of that functionality, you don't need to have virtual as much. So. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, why don't we need to say something like this? So it's not wrong to say this, but essentially we're calling lawyers vacation days and lawyers vacation days just happens to be employees vacation days. So we don't need to explicitly say go to employees vacation days because there's nothing in the lawyer class to, that would like conflict with the employees vacation days. What do you say? Specify what exactly? So we did that in the .h file by saying that we're extending employee. And because we don't have our own vacation days method for the lawyer, then it'll automatically use the employee's vacation days. Great questions. Um, yeah, if you're interested, another way to kind of get around this that's a little bit more intuitive is something called composition, which instead of saying like, okay, I'm going to... You know, I'm a G right, or I'm a square, and I'm going to say that I'm also a rectangle. You, or like I'm a sorted vector, and I'm going to say I'm also a vector. You instead just keep like a vector as a private instance variable. So then, whenever you need to um, call, you know, get at index whatever, you just return. You, your method would look something like vector dot get whatever on your instance variable. So if you're interested in that, that's called composition. Yes, yeah, so the question is, if you privately inherit, um, what does that actually, like, is that equivalent to saying, okay, so we privately inherited from employees, so we take all of employees' public stuff, and we basically are putting it privately down here. Um, not the constructor, but the rest of it. Yeah, so those are equivalent, um, or not, those are logically equivalent, or conceptually equivalent. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, okay, so that's what's happening with the employee, you know, say, basically calling this private, like, saying that we privately extend. This is not actually written like that, and so what then happens is, since we publicly have vacation form here, that takes precedence, so we do have a public vacation form. Great question. So the question is, if we did want to have vacation days be public, um, virtual, I think it's an int, uh, vacation days. So the way that we would do that is in our lawyer, we would have int lawyer vacation days, and then we can just return um, employee vacation days. And that's kind of, that's a really common model that you'll see, where you're just calling this super classes method. Um, great questions. I just wanted to very briefly touch upon C++, unlike basically every other object-oriented programming language like Java or Python, um, allows you to do multiple inheritance, which allows you to say that something is a two things. So, for example, there are input streams and output streams right in um, C++, and so you can write that as an I.O. stream. Um, which are both an input stream and an output stream. It's a stream you can read and write to. Um, one of the just one of the reasons why most other programming languages don't have this is because a lot of times people will be like, okay, I have like a baby class and I have a dog class, so I want to make a puppy class. So a puppy both is a baby and is a dog. So I'll just extend both, and then like all of a sudden your code just breaks because babies eat very differently from how dogs eat. And you know, babies make different sounds from what dogs make. And so which one should puppy have? Right? So, um, yeah, that's basically multiple inheritance. You don't really need to ever do this. Okay.
Great. Thank you so much and see you on Monday.